Hello and welcome to Out and About Art, your PGTV source for all things art in Polk County. I'm your host, Dion Spires. On this episode of Out and About Art, we're taking a look at a local nonprofit organization which strives to bring music education to all ages. The Dr. Jesse Owens Academy of Fine Arts provides music lessons to the lower income youth of our Polk County area. These lessons span over a variety of types of music to provide a more well-rounded education. In addition to these youth lessons, they have an adult choir which brings R&B, jazz, classical, gospel, and spiritual stylings to the Polk County scene. I caught up with Dr. Jessie Owens herself and a few of those involved with her organization to find out more. She was my seventh grade chorus teacher um, and she, she was a very, very uh, energetic, very passionate about her music. She loved her music and um, it was one of the impacts she had with me um, in regards to music. Dr. Owens, she, she's probably one of the, no she ain't probably, she is one of the best instructors in the area. And uh, I've watched her, I've watched her um, for the last past 13, 14, 15 years and uh, She's been phenomenal. When I was introduced to her, we shared music, friendship, basically very deep friendship. And after her retirement, she called me one day and she said, hey, I think I want to turn the old house into an academy. What do you think? And I went, yes, do it. And uh, we done some things and got it together and uh, it has successfully worked out. The Academy is a center of arts for this community. Um, we have different churches who have their programs, but I'm trying to uh, uh, get a group of students who want to uh, study the instrument, the instrument, the piano perhaps, and the saxophone, which I have skills in, and the oboe, to preserve and learn the skill of music. Many in today's climate, you have kids who like music but don't want to sit down and take the time to perfect it and learn it. And so I'm teaching the basic uh, after school music program of learn to read music, musical theory, 30 to 40 minutes of intensive piano lesson. We have a computer active program on music theory and we have an online uh, theory lesson for beginning kids that's kind of a cartoonish nature and but it captures the interest and the old worksheet that we had from years ago with the after series. So I'm trying to give them a full circle of music. As a child in this community and in this state, I've seen some of the music programs uh, decrease in numbers. The enrollment is not as, as, as large as it has been. And I don't know what the real reason behind that. It may be because of high state testing and the state requirements for kids to uh, take a certain, certain number of academic classes. But as in this community, we had, and all over Polk County, uh, we had 50 and 70 uh, kids in a band unit in our little Jude High School here back in the day. And I'm wondering, well, where, what are the kids doing now with that talent and skill that, that was prevalent during my time? The kids still have music in them. They still have needs inside them that needs to be met. So uh, I know that there are music programs in every school in Bo County because we are very good at this. But there are some that fall through the cracks that just don't get the opportunity to be in those programs. And my program services low income and disadvantaged students. It is an opportunity, an opportunity to learn and a safe place to hone your craft. Um, a lot of places that um, require music don't create the space and the opportunity to develop your craft. They give you space to use it, um, um, use your craft, but not to develop it. And um, with her giving the community an opportunity and a space to do that, I think that is just priceless. Um, I do know in times past when I was a kid that there were places that were set up that kind of created, um, that catered to the arts, whether it be dance, whether it be music, vocal or instruments and all. They're not common these days. And so um, I think that kids need to be nurtured in the direction of being creative and not destructive. And I think that that gives a, an opportunity for them to, to find out what's inside of them and to explore that instead of um, just having an adventure that is purely external. This program 
has and probably still will as long as we can get funding and we'll do whatever we do, enhance the abilities of, of young people uh, trying to pursue music. We're trying to offer a variety of music to those kids who don't hear the classics, be it black, African-American, or European, so that we can one day have another Van Clyburn, another uh, uh, Jesse Norman, another uh, Quincy Jones, another Dr. William P. Foster. So if you're going to rap all your days and you're going to uh, sing funk music all your days, you're not going to hear anything else. We're gonna, we, we tend to hear and, and see and do what we hear a lot of times. And we're just trying to spread it all out and say, here are your other options. Come, the table is open and set for you to come. You want to study music? I'm here to give, to give, to share, to share, as long as God gives me health and strength to do it. To keep up with their performances and find out more about the Fine Arts Academy, visit www.joensacademyfinearts.com. Now I'm here at the Polk Museum of Art in Lakeland to talk about an exciting new partnership in our local art scene. The museum has joined forces with another very prominent Lakeland presence, Florida Southern College, to build a partnership to give greater educational opportunities to its students and our community. Here to tell me all of the details about this partnership are Claire Orologis, the Executive Director of the Polk Museum of Art, and Dr. Alexander Rich, who is the Director of Galleries and Exhibitions. How are you guys doing today? Great, thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you for being here to talk with me and taking time out of your busy schedules, because I know you guys have been very busy with the partnership starting up. I want to start off by giving the viewers a little bit of knowledge of what this partnership is and why it came, came about. So let's start off by talking about the partnership and what it's doing in our community. I'd be glad to address that. Uh, this has been a conversation that's been going on for about 16 months. The Polk Museum of Art has had a very strong presence and a long history in this community and it was founded by the Junior League of Greater Lakeland, uh, who had the vision to have a museum in their community uh, to serve all of Polk County. And over the years, the museum has been able to uh, keep up and sustain, but we've never gotten to the point where we could really grow. We had uh, some very high aspirations, ways that we wanted to serve the community, ways that the community wanted uh, to be engaged with the arts that we were not able to provide if we were not on a growth trajectory. And it was at that moment, through a discussion with our board, that the idea of approaching Florida Southern College to affiliate uh, came about. And the reason uh, we were talking to Florida Southern College is it's a very natural fit. They're two blocks away. Uh, they're, uh, they have the largest collection of Frank Lloyd Wright buildings in the world. They have a very strong arts program. Uh, and the beauty of this affiliation is that it will help both organizations to do more uh, and to serve the broader academic community. So not just Florida Southern College students, but the broader academic community. Now, Dr. Rich, I know that um, Florida Southern is, correct me if I'm wrong, providing artwork here for exhibits, but also allowing the students to get more involved with the art here. So elaborate on that for me. Yeah, for us on our end of it, I think bringing the academic culture of the college into the museum world is exciting for both the purpose of students themselves but also for the whole community in Polk County. For us, we'll be helping to make higher caliber exhibitions, we'll help to organize those exhibitions. We are also increasing what we can show as part of the permanent collection. We have 500 plus works of American figured art coming into the collection. And while those will officially belong to the college, they will be housed and on showcase here practically around the year. For students, it's going to be the ability for them to work more in the museum, um, hopefully begin to experience museums firsthand with internships and work-study jobs. And then at the same time, that should hopefully enhance the community experience of it as well, because as far as I'm concerned, and I think that Claire believes the exact same thing, is that academics can be for everyone, that there's no one thing that's just coming to a museum is for pure superficial enjoyment of the works. You can also learn something, and I think everyone will learn something from this process. Oh, for sure, definitely. Now, um, you've got a lot of hats at Florida Southern, and you're very qualified to be working in this partnership. Um, let's tell the community a little bit about your background in art history and how that can contribute to what you guys are doing here. Yeah, um, at the same time, I'll be doing exhibitions work here, working a little bit on the curatorial side. I'm also the assistant pre professor of art history at Florida Southern, and I run the art history program. Um, I 
have a, yeah, a long history working in museums back in New York City. I've worked at the Metropolitan Museum and the Whitney Museum and the Brooklyn Museum. And uh, in college, I worked at the Hood Museum of Art at Dartmouth and got my PhD in New York City at the Institute of Fine Arts, NYU. So I've had a lot of in-depth work with art history that I hope will also enhance the experience of what I can contribute to the museum and help to put on exhibitions like some of the ones that we have around us here, which are really the relaunch exhibitions of this new alliance between the school and the museum. That's great. Now, Claire, let's talk about those exhibitions a little bit. Um, you've got two open right now in partnership with Florida Southern. Tell me about those. Uh, well, Dr. Rich is the one who did the legwork when we first began the discussions on this affiliation. And we wanted to have exhibitions that would really reflect the possibilities of the affiliation. And uh, Alex made contact with a gallery owner in The Hague. Uh, and to make a very long story short, it ended in this incredible exhibition of old Dutch masters from private collections. Uh, the exhibition that is in the neighbor, neighboring gallery behind us is a small sample of the 500 plus works that Alex was talking to us. Uh, that have been gifted to Florida Southern College that will be housed here and curated here. And that will actually be curated to travel to other uh, museums as well. Oh, wow. So it's even moving out of Polk County after it's finished here. It is, which has been one of our goals. And we just haven't uh, been in a position to do that. But now, uh, not only can we, but uh, we really need to. And part of the benefit of that is that by doing homegrown shows, we are both going to be creating new collaborative networks with other institutions, but also getting the name of the Polk Museum of Art at Florida Southern College out there, getting some of the artists that will have really strong collections of their works, their names out there as well. And it's really just going to expand our influence and hopefully draw more people into the museum. So you say that you have over 500 works that you can bring into here. Um, what was the motivation for picking this particular exhibit for kind of the kickoff? Um, well, we are going to have a, an exclusive collecting focus going forward with the college's art collection of the figure in American art. No other institution has that as its primary collecting focus. So we really hope to create a niche market in that. So you can come to the Polk Museum of Art and you will see great collections of art across the a lot of 20th century, but then we'll even go back further, but all centering around the exclusive inclusion of at least a figure in each of the works. And it means it's vastly open-ended. You can go as abstract as possible. You can also go extremely academic in terms of the figuration. And so as we build out that collection, we'll have a lot of options, thematic exhibitions, which I'm really excited to begin working on um, when we have a few moments to breathe after this process. We are literally a week and a half into this. Um, so we're excited about that, having you know, thematic shows that maybe surround, say, figures in landscapes or the nude or genre scenes. This exhibition as a launch is really just trying to show the variety of what the American figure can hold. And if you walk into the show, it's really fun because as you move from one work to another, you look at works in all different media, you look at works in all different sizes, you have sculptures next to drawings next to graphic works. So it really should show the potential of where this can go. Yeah, definitely. And it's interesting to hear you say that you guys are offering something that no other um, museum really has because it's great to enrich your art community here, but it's even better to bring people here to see what our art community has to offer because Polk County's art community is very rich, I've come to find out in recent years. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the future. Um, we were talking about the exhibits that are here now, but what down the road, what is the goal of this partnership for whether that be for the community or for the students? Well, there are a few, but one of them is to use the, um, this affiliation to uh, not only elevate both organizations to better serve our community, but to really be a bigger draw uh, for people outside of Polk County. Um, there's no reason why, through this affiliation, this could not become uh, one of the very finest academic museums also in the country. If you look at uh, institutions of higher learning uh, that are ranked very highly, uh, they all have art museums associated with them. It adds something very important to academic life. Uh, and as I said before, uh, we want to serve broadly. So. Uh, elevating everything that we do is uh, a goal, and therefore, you know, attracting people to the area to enjoy it as well is another goal. 
And to, to add to that, an exciting part about an academic museum, both from the campus perspective and then from all the area institutions and the community perspective, is this idea that art can cross disciplines or cross specific interests. One major goal, I think, of museums is to somehow find something that attracts any viewer who comes to the museum. So everybody will find something that he or she will enjoy or that they can take from the experience. And so no matter if you are someone who is familiar with art or an artist yourself or someone who takes biology classes over at Florida Southern College or someone who works in a factory or somebody who is in a supermarket or somebody who is a CEO of some corporation, everybody can come to the museum and find something that will draw them in. And we'll try to develop exhibitions that also speak across boundaries and hopefully everyone will really find something that will want them to come back to the Polk Museum. That's a very important point uh, and the other point about uh, the academic affiliation is that this is not only to interact with students who are in, uh, part of a, an art program. This cuts across all scholarly disciplines. Uh, so that history students, political science students, language, English students, poetry, the full range of academics can be touched upon through the art. And, and we're choosing exhibitions with that in mind, um, speaking with artists. So if artists also dabble in poetry, especially, I'm wondering, well, okay, then we definitely want to integrate poetry in there and draw in the English department. And also that draws in maybe some people who maybe not specifically like one style of art, but they are really drawn to poetry. So whatever we can do within exhibitions also to cross boundaries, to attract people from different departments on campus, but also from wherever they're coming from, whatever walk of life. I think that's one of the key elements of what makes a museum a really strong museum. That's very unique. I've never really noticed another museum incorporating poetry or writing or anything like that in with that form of art because... We actually have an annual program uh, with Southeastern University poetry students. Really? They create original works of art in response to what we have on view. It's a wonderful event every year and we look forward to broadening that. That's very, very cool. And Dr. Rich, you mentioned that um, even in this exhibit, there's different types of um, mediums of art. So is that something that you guys will continue to do down the line? You're not going to come in and just see a bunch of paintings on the wall? No, obviously there, there is a great allure of paintings and we know that the community and everyone likes to see paintings and this exhibit shows that these are real master works of art from the 17th century. But absolutely, the whole point of a museum is to expose people to various media. And also, I'm a firm believer in the idea that you can be exhausted by the idea of only seeing the same style of art, even within a singular exhibition. It's nice to train your eye on different things as you move from wall to wall, or you look at a vitrine. We hope to have, bring in archival works as well. So if we're talking about specific artists, you also see some of the works that come from behind the making of their works, take you into the mind of the artist too. So we are absolutely, um, I think we are both really firm believers in the idea of integrating multimedia into any exhibition where possible. Absolutely. And I think one of the coolest things about the Polk Museum of Art is that you can see all of this for free admission. It's, that's yes. staying intact, right? It is staying intact because we have generous supporters to underwrite admission uh, who feel strongly. This is an educational institution and they feel strongly uh, that educational access should have no barriers. And we have seen the fruit of that gift um, on the part of the uh, attendance, on the part of the public. Uh, we were um, at about 130,000 visitors a year for a while, and in the last few years we've jumped up to 140,000. So it makes a difference. It makes a difference uh, for people to know that they can come here and enjoy their museum at no cost. Absolutely. That's amazing. That's a huge growth. So let's talk a little bit more about your future with the partnership here. What types of exhibitions can the community and those students be expecting to come? One of the exhibitions that's coming in the spring is a Hudson River School exhibition. Uh, one large scale painting will be coming from the Smithsonian and these are 19th century American landscapes, very beautiful. And I'll let Dr. Rich talk about the other exhibitions coming because he's organized some great ones. Yeah, there are going to be some really exciting ones. In addition to the Hudson River School, which is huge, and I think the public will love that, students will love that, everybody will love that. Um, beginning in December, we're going to have a Renoir Drawings exhibition, which will last for a few months through the big annual gala at the museum as well. That will be followed up by a Masters of Spain exhibition featuring works by Goya and Picasso. Um, and then we have others to tease out farther in the future, but maybe that'll draw you back to talk to us again about those. Um, but I think that covers some of the yes. big ones through the spring. Yeah, those are some big names. Yeah. So definitely something to draw in the, the residents here and hopefully from outside like we talked yes. about. Well, it's 
an amazing partnership that you guys have here. It's only just begun, and I'm excited to see how it can grow for you guys. So thank you for being here to talk about it. Thank you so Thanks. much for having Thanks us. Thanks very much. This partnership gives the museum opportunities to pull new exhibits, and they have two running currently. They're Rembrandt Academy and The Figure in American Art. Be on the lookout for even more on the way. For more information on events and exhibits here at the Polk Museum of Art, visit www.polkmuseumofart.org. Now we're going to give you a look at an award-winning theater production, which comes from right here in our own county. Theater Winter Haven's production of the Amish, Amish Project has garnered recognition both regionally and on a state level at the Southeastern Theater Conference and the Florida Theater Conference over the last year. Now they've taken off to Minnesota to compete on a national level and show the talent that we have here in Polk County. I caught up with the director and the cast during their last rehearsal before they take off to give you a sneak peek of the show and hear what they had to say about their experiences thus far. So the Amish Project is a play by Jessica Dickey. It takes its plot from the 2006 school shooting in Nickel Mines, Pennsylvania, which happened at an Amish schoolhouse where 10 young girls were shot by the local milkman. But really what the play is about is the response of the Amish community to that shooting. Man enters Amish schoolhouse and opens fire. When Dan Chesnica asked me if I wanted to direct something for competition, I started looking for plays. Um, Dan encouraged me to use plays that would really challenge, challenge us, challenge me, challenge the actors. And I got it narrowed down to five or six plays that were really, really good. Um, and they were in a pile and I kept reading through them and I couldn't decide and I couldn't decide. And the Amish Project was in that pile. Um, and then the Pulse shooting ha happened June 12th of last year. And I woke up that morning and walked down the hall to my library and picked up that script and thought, this is the play we're gonna do. Because I think we're gonna have to talk about this stuff. For some reason, the run of our, of, of Amish Project has covered a lot of tragedies that feel very similar to the tragedy we deal with in our show. And so it sort of opens up um, a new life every time we revisit it. The play is very beautiful. Um, it is not violent in any way, but it does frankly discuss a violent act. Um, one of the interesting qualities of this play is that we get to intimately know the spouse of the killer. We never hear about those people. And so this play gives us a very poignant portrayal of what that experience is like. And we fall in love with her. She's a wonderful character. She struggles a lot with guilt, feelings of guilt and confusion because she really did not, it wasn't like this was something where she was like, oh, wow. Well, okay, it makes sense. It, it, I mean, it came out of nowhere for her and um, she kind of like carries around the guilt that he has, that he should have, I guess, she sort of takes that on herself and has to somehow figure out how to release that and continue living her life one way or another. As I was reading the play and thinking about our players at Theatre Winter Haven, I thought this would be a great representation of us. For example, we have two kids that came out of our Theatre Winter Haven Academy. We have our veteran actors and actresses, Sarah Catherine Barnes, who is brilliant and who I want, knew I wanted to have as an anchor of this show, even before I read a single play. Um, so knowing that we had her and Larry and Darian, and it gave us a chance to bring in someone new, which I think is really important part of Theater Winter Haven's heritage as well. So as I read this play and started putting the people 
with the roles. That's what appealed to me a lot. Never mind that the story is brilliant. The writing is impeccable. It is just a fantastic play, I think, to represent our theater. And it's also a fantastic play, period. It's a hard hour. It's not an, it's not an easy show. It's not theater that you can sort of sit back and relax and experience. It is something that sort of pulls you immediately into the center of the story and it places you in each of these characters positions. What would you do if you were in this situation? And it challenges you because you see every single side. I, I say that this play is like if you were to drop a, a pebble into a piece of water and the pebble is the event and then all the ripples, ha you know, there's a cause and effect and, and it sort of forces you to go, okay, this is messy. And if you were in this situation, how would you deal with it? And what would you do? What would you say? And how would you, you know? So um, <clears throat> the reaction from the audience has been, it's always been positive in that they felt like it was honest and, they've, and they were touched by it. But some people have a hard time. We have some people who come back three, four times, they follow us. And then we have people who are like, I really appreciated it. I can never see it again. It's too much. This is the sixth time Theatre Winter Haven's gone to nationals. We've never won. Um, and we are the only theater in the country to have gone this many times, made it to nationals this many times. So yeah, it's very exciting. I'm actually just ready to get there. I want to get to the competition and um, not even really even focusing on winning, but focusing on sharing our story. And you know, like again, like I said, since it's so real and something that is a, kind of like a reoccurring event that's happening within our world today. I think that I'm just ready to get that message out about you know forgiveness and love and any of the other morals that are represented within our show. So excited, so excited. I love my community. I love Winter Haven. I love that this is the show and these are the people that are representing our community as we go on the road, be it Gainesville or Lexington or now going up to Rochester. Um, I mean, I think I get to, I have the best job in the whole show because I get to sit in the back and just kind of soak in the pride for a whole lot and don't have to do that much work after everything's set up. You know, the fact that it was Tommy Altman who designed the lights and designed the set, the fact that it's Katrina directing it, the fact that it's these seven people up there, never mind the crew that we have, Francis Fort and Robert Marks, Kadish Lewis, these are all stars that have been with Theater Winter Haven for ever. So I'm just thrilled to be able to have a spectator seat for everything that happens, never mind being a small part of it. It's exciting, it's scary. You know, we just want to tell our story. I've told them over and over again that they can't do anything more to make me prouder. They, I'm as proud as I can be. I'm not a competitive person, so for me, it's taking it out into the world for other people to respond to it. I think that, uh, you know, we've already won. <laughs> That's how I feel anyway. Theater Winter Haven finished its competition in Minnesota with three more awards under their belt. Eva Martin won Best Featured Actress in a Show, Grace Brixa won the Youth Monologue Competition, and their technical crew came away with outstanding achievement and backstage teamwork. Congratulations to one of our many local community theaters. You've certainly made Polk County proud. That's all the time that we have for this episode, but there's always plenty of activity going on in our local Polk County art scene. Stay tuned for a list of events coming up in your area. As always, thank you for joining me and tune in next month for more art out and about.